A crime, forgotten, suppressed, concealed. A crime from which all of Germany profited. Forced labor was the most public crime committed by the Nazis. So my way to survive is to help the enemy who wants to murder me. Uh, but there's no way out of that. It, it was not just prisoners of war, it was these millions of civilians who'd been deported against their will. There were real manhunts taking place. I don't know where you could have lived in Germany and not seen forced laborers, really. Germany, 1933. Democracy was dead. The Reichstag had burned, and then the emergency decrees were issued, which marked the beginning of the persecution of the Nazis' political opponents, trade unionists, socialists, and communists. Ein ungeheures Aufsehen, eine irrsinnige Angst bei den Kommunisten, bei den sozialdemokratischen Funktionären. Und dann, kurz nach Beginn der Aktion, kommen dann die ersten politischen Gefangenen. In Hitler's Reich, forced labor was introduced just a few weeks after the National Socialists took power. In March 1933, one of the first concentration camps was opened in Oranienburg. Here, people were tortured and murdered and made to carry out forced labor. The economic aspect was only the second consideration. The main motivation was to terrorize exclude and persecute those who were considered unacceptable. Control and re-education. Take people that uh, the regime deems as, as uh, potentially dangerous in one way or another and uh, re-educate them. And the forced labor is part of that re-educating, in quotation marks. Dachau concentration camp near Munich. The National Socialists had been in power for less than eight weeks when 150 internees were brought here from nearby prisons. Convicted criminals and political prisoners were subjected to punishment, humiliation, torture, and death. None of this was conducted secretly or away from the public eye. Until the mid-1930s, there was extensive reporting about the concentration camps and pictures were even shown of people forced to perform degrading tasks. The initial forced labor doesn't really have a goal other than making people suffer by doing forced labor. This is really as a part of humiliation of the people. Germany had a day off. In 1933, May the 1st was declared an official public holiday. There were celebrations throughout the country and on the Tempelhof field in Berlin. It was a day to honor the workers and Adolf Hitler, who was already preparing the next move. From then on, the Nazis would determine what real work was and how German workers were to be organized. The following day, the trade union buildings were seized and trade unions were banned. To put it simply, it was a case of carrot and stick. The carrot was given on May the 1st and the stick on May the 2nd, 1933. Free trade unions were crushed and the right to strike was abolished. All Germans were required to make their contribution to the people's community through work. Nazi propaganda valued physical work in particular. Nicht die intellektuellen Schichten haben mir den Mut gegeben, dieses gigantische Werk zu beginnen. Sondern das kann ich sagen, den Mut habe ich nur gefasst, weil ich zwei Schichten kannte, den Bauer und den deutschen Arbeiter. Work was a very important part of the self-image of the National Socialist State and of the people's community. Every individual should contribute and find fulfillment in this community. In other words, it was work that distinguished people. There was even a slogan, work ennobles. That applied to all Aryan Germans who made their contribution. 
All young men aged 18 and over, and later all young women, known as Arbeitsmeiden, or work maidens, were to do their duty. The Reich Labour Service was voluntary, at least officially, until 1935. From that point on, it was compulsory for young people. Ultimately, it wasn't really possible to avoid this labor service, and it also involved a loss of freedom, since the young men working in the labor service were accommodated in camps. However, they did receive a wage, and they weren't paid badly compared to the forced laborers, some of whom received no pay at all. Those the Nazis excluded from the people's community were increasingly made to carry out forced labor. As well as criminals and political prisoners, this group included beggars, homeless people, and vagrants. By mid-1933, the Nazis had arrested around 100,000 so-called shirkers. The Emsland region, green, idyllic, peaceful. 80 years ago, this was a bleak moorland in one of Germany's poorest regions. The Nazis built several concentration camps in the area from the spring of 1933 onwards. The methods tested here by the SA and SS became standard procedure in all the concentration camps. This included forced labor. The prisoners had to drain and then cultivate the moor. Johann Esser, a communist and trade unionist, was one of many arrested by the Nazis without trial and made to work without any official release date. The working conditions were terrible. Look at the moor now and imagine working under the hot sun from morning to night, with almost nothing to eat or drink. It's no wonder so many people became so ill. Certainly people died here, there's no doubt about that. That was something they were perfectly prepared to see. Nowadays, people simply can't imagine what it was like. Even though it was long ago and it doesn't affect us directly today, it's still upsetting even thinking about it. In the camps in the Emsland region, the prisoners were made to work in inhuman conditions. This was the case for Johann Esser. He grew up in an orphanage. Later, he became a weaver, then a trade unionist, a communist, agitator, and poet. He was an autodidact. He must have taught himself an enormous number of things, and he developed his talent for writing quite early on. In the Bergamoer concentration camp, Johann Esser and another prisoner wrote the Song of the Peat Bog Soldiers. The anthem of Emsland's forced laborers was taken up by resistance movements all over the world. In the years that followed, Johann Esser was repeatedly sent to the concentration camps for hard labor. While the opponents of National Socialism were progressively silenced or simply disappeared, the majority of Germans supported Hitler's rule. The dictator had ambitious plans for them. By 1940, Germany was to be equipped for war. And then it would seize new Lebensraum, living space in the East. Tag um Tag verlassen Massen von Panzern die deutschen Rüstungswerke. The German labor force didn't have the capacity to produce all the arms required. Despite their racial fanaticism and xenophobia, the Nazis were forced to bring foreigners into the country. The Gastarbeitnehmer, or guest workers, were mainly Italians. At that time, they still came voluntarily. During the 1930s, there were a series of recruitment agreements with countries that supported the Nazi regime. So there was an influx, for instance, of Italian workers, extending the VW factory in Wolfsburg. 
They came from other countries too, like Bulgaria and Czechoslovakia. Most were called contract workers. They weren't forced laborers in the classic sense. The four-year plan. Starting from 1936, Germany was to be ready for war within four years. The economy must be fully autonomous, not dependent on imports. And the German army must be equipped with enough modern weapons. For this purpose, everyone fit to work was mobilized, or nearly everyone. When it came to the Jews, the Nazis had other plans. Steps that began to be taken in 1933, in full view of the general public, took on increasingly radical forms. The goal of the regime was, first of all, to sideline the Jews, that is, to get them out of the roles they play in German society, especially in uh, economic roles, in educational roles, and so on, get them out. The November pogroms, 1938. Hundreds of Jews in Germany and Austria were murdered. Thousands of synagogues, shops, apartments, and cemeteries were destroyed. Even before these attacks, most German Jews had already lost their work and their income. In December 1938, the head of the German Labour Administration, Friedrich Syrup, had the idea of using unemployed Jews for forced labour. Of course, we shouldn't forget that these people had been systematically made unemployed by the National Socialist regime. The Nazis then used this against them, claiming that they were shirkers, who were a burden on the economy and who should finally learn how to do a useful day's work. The first people forced to work in the German Reich were political prisoners, those serving normal prison sentences, Jews, Sinti and Roma, and so-called asocials. Nearly all of them came from Germany and Austria, and nearly all were men. My sense is that the drive against the supposed work shy was a drive above all against men, and you had the, the so-called action against the work shy on a much larger scale, where the Gestapo arrested maybe a couple of thousand in the spring of 38, and the Kripo, then another maybe 10,000. Again, that the work shy, the targets of this anti-work shy campaign, that they were above all men. The Tot organization, a paramilitary construction group, was formed in 1938. It was headed by Fritz Tot, an ardent Nazi, who was tasked primarily with building facilities needed for war, such as bunkers. Later, under the management of Albert Speer, the organization exploited over one million forced laborers. In the years leading up to the war, however, the workers were still mainly Germans who had been conscripted for labor duty. This wasn't yet forced labor that changed during the war when the Todd organization began to force foreign workers en masse as forced laborers in the occupied territories and then from the middle of the war onwards in the territory of the Reich itself. After six and a half years in power, Hitler unleashed the Second World War. His goal was to illegally seize land and raw materials and to subjugate peoples. Polen hat heute Nacht zum ersten Mal auf unserem eigenen Territorium auch mit bereits regulären Soldaten geschossen. Seit 5.45 Uhr wird jetzt zurückgeschossen. September the 1st, 1939, Germany goes to war. The Wehrmacht attacks Poland. The Nazi forced labor system reaches a new level of escalation. 
First the Wehrmacht came, then the Labour administration. The first thing they did was to take stock of the entire population to get an idea of who was able to work. Anyone who refused to register with the Labour authorities was denied all access to food. The enslavement of the Poles began. Their factories were closed or taken over by German businesses. The Polish civilian population was forced to work for the victors. Most of the 400,000 Polish soldiers taken prisoner were forcibly transferred to Germany. According to the Geneva Convention, the rights of soldiers who were taken prisoner must be protected. The convention covered the conditions and equipment of prisoner of war camps and the provision of food, clothing, medical treatment and sanitary facilities. It provided for monthly examinations by doctors. The use of prisoners as labor in the enemy's armaments industry was forbidden. However, these provisions did not apply to civilian forced laborers. The Polish prisoners of war were taken to the Reich to prisoners of war camps. However, some of them were relatively quickly given civilian status and some of them remained in the Reich as laborers. At the latest, by this point, they must be regarded as forced laborers. Hans Frank. As a lawyer, he represented Hitler in over 40 trials. Now he was made head of the general government in Poland. Frank resided in Wawel Castle in Krakow. And he spent a great deal of time here, in a palace near Kresowiecy. Hitler's governor surrounded himself with an army of servants, looting art treasures and anything else he desired. This was my father's weekend palace, so to speak. I don't know how he found out about this beautiful palace, as we always called it. It wasn't actually available. My father simply seized it from Count Pototsky, and then he spent a great deal of time here. It's not far from Krakow, perhaps half an hour's drive. He loved being here. And he often salved his guilty conscience by playing the piano. Hans Frank had five children with his wife Brigitte. When his son Niklas was born in March 1939, Frank was already the most powerful lawyer in the Nazi state. He drove to Berlin to our official villa and knelt before my mother and said, Brigitte, you will be Queen of Poland. My mother liked that very much. Hans Frank rose to the top as Hitler's lawyer. Then, as governor general, he became the butcher of Poland. He was among those responsible for the murder of hundreds of thousands of people, the establishment of the ghettos, and the deportation of Polish forced laborers. He was an educated person and he knew very well that he was responsible for countless horrific crimes, which he himself had partly initiated. How under such circumstances can anyone live here and have fun at the weekend, receive guests, play the piano, read books? It's simply beyond my comprehension. The German occupiers systematically looted the country, and regarded the Poles as nothing more than a primitive people of workers. Hans Frank, as the uh, general governor and with his, his uh, whole civil administration that he created, he created the system that despoiled the Jews, that despoiled Poles, that uh, set quotas for Polish farmers to hand over their crops and so on. Uh, that pushed uh, Poles out of leadership positions in cities and towns. and So that, that's his doing. Hans Frank imposed a compulsory work order. All Poles between 14 and 70 had to work for the Germans, either in Poland or in the Reich. They included Boleslaw Zajakowski, 
He was 16 when the Germans took over control of his hometown. I am Polish. I live in the city of Lodz. I've spent most of my life here. The Germans arrived in Lodz as early as September the 9th. The Wehrmacht, the German army, was followed immediately by German officials. They formed an entire administration. It was very cleverly organized by the Germans. Initially, the Germans tried to recruit volunteers to work in the German Reich with advertising campaigns. But this approach met with little success. And so the SS, the police and the Wehrmacht rounded people up throughout the country to transport them to Germany. With lists, the Germans, the gendarmes, the German police, went from one apartment to the next and just took us with them. Just like I'm sitting here, wearing a jumper and a shirt. I was eating dinner. They simply came and took me away. I think it was a very sudden and, um, yeah, sudden and shocking experience. And I think that's why in the memories of um, forced labourers, men and women, that moment of seizure and deportation and arrival um, is almost the, the, most, the most vivid. The deportations to Germany began. Mostly it was young people who were taken, many of them women. So my sense is in the winter of 39-40, the big push um, in the labor offices in occupied Poland is to recruit men and women for agricultural work. And Göring says very clearly in November 1939 that Polish and Polish girls, um, should be particularly recruited for work on German farms. Before the war, many Poles had been employed by German farmers as seasonal workers. Now they were forced laborers, cheap workers without any rights. That was a big lesson that the Nazis had learned from the economy in the First World War. Come what may, we must keep the farms going. We must keep the population fed. They not only plundered the occupied territories to achieve this, but they also brought forced laborers from the occupied territories to Germany. Boleslav Zayakovsky from Loc particularly suffered as a result. He was taken to Germany's Ruhr region to work in the mines. It was terribly hard work. We had such short shovels, we had to work on our knees. Sometimes the seams were 80 centimeters high. Then there was a gap, then 1 meter 20 again. So the work was difficult. Hot water ran down the walls. Gas was a problem, and it was very hot. If a wagon derailed, they beat me. If the German guard was good, he'd just smack me on the head or say, stupid Pollack. But if he was cruel, he'd punch me hard. Ultimately, a large number of Germans who regarded themselves as being the master race really did become masters. They became masters over the army of foreign slaves who were made to carry out forced labor. Quite a few really behaved like masters, as though they were slave owners. In the summer of 1940, 700,000 Poles were already working as forced laborers in Germany. Eighty years later, the story of two Polish brothers brought these three men together. They are Slavomir Pakita, the great-grandson of one of the brothers, Andreas Bialas, a Polish historian, and Hilarius Heusler, a German farmer. He researched what happened to the two forced laborers and found a photo that reminded him of Stefan and Stanislav Duda. The two brothers worked in a sawmill and lived in the village of Ochiaseki near the town of Kielce. 
Then the Germans came. At that moment, there was a raid near the station. The Gestapo and others parked four lorries there. They gathered up everyone, since they clearly knew that a lot of young and healthy men would be on their way home from work. Obviously, they were the ones they wanted. In 1940, Stefan and Stanislav Duda were transported to Kryburg on the Inn in Bavaria. They were made to work for farmers who had reported that they needed forced labor. Stefan was put to work on the Ederhof farm, while his brother Stanislav was taken to the Nemerhof. It was nice for them that they had at least ended up in the same place. And they did the same work as the Germans. They flirted and made friends and had love affairs. And Stefan Duda fell in love with Anna Meyerhofer, the farmer's daughter. For the head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, love between the German masters and the Slav Untermenschen, or subhumans, was forbidden. The Polish decrees came into force in March 1940. Polish forced laborers were made to wear a letter P that was clearly visible on their clothing. They were paid less money and were given less and poorer quality food than Germans. All Poles were forbidden to go out after sunset. They were not allowed to own any valuables. Visits to bars and restaurants were forbidden. Using public transport was forbidden. Contact with Germans was strictly forbidden. Anyone flouting these rules was threatened with severe punishment. They wanted to prevent friendships between the forced laborers and the young Germans. Now, we don't know exactly who first mentioned this love affair or who denounced them. Feelings like jealousy and fear were involved. The parents were afraid of what would happen to their children if they came into contact with the forced laborers. And it was a wonderful opportunity for prominent local Nazis to make an example of them. Poles and Germans fell in love, despite the harsh penalties. Sometimes they went undetected, but sometimes there were terrible consequences. I think it was an obsession of Himmler's particularly, but more generally a concern about racial pollution. The idea that somehow foreign, foreign men as predators and impregnators of German women, I think it was a symbolic violation of the, of the nation, if you like. German women were seen as the, so to speak, cultural markers, the, um, the symbols of, 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 of German race and German blood. And if they'd done it willingly, it was shameful for them. So they were, of course, punished too. In the eyes of the Nazis, the German women were guilty of Rassenschande, or racial defilement. They were publicly humiliated and, in most cases, sent to concentration camps. But if German men had contact with Slav women, the situation was rather different. Then the punishment was far less severe. I don't know of any German man who was sent to a concentration camp because he had a sexual relationship with an Eastern European woman or was accused of having one. Finally, Anna Meyerhofer, the German girl, was sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp. 
Her Polish lover, Stefan Duda, was imprisoned for eight months. You can still see where he and other Poles were locked up in the cellar of the town hall in Kreiburg. The Moor in Emsland. Johann Esser, former member of the German Communist Party, was no longer in the Bergermoor concentration camp, but his song of resistance was still being sung. For seven years, the communist poet was repeatedly arrested and sent to the camps. He lost his job, and he and his family faced great hardship. Now, his poems sounded different. In the poems he wrote between 1940 and, I think, 1942, he had come to terms with the regime, it has to be said. It was a traumatic time for everyone involved, and my grandfather probably had no choice. I believe he had no strength left to continue his fight against the Nazis, because he had been imprisoned and harassed so many times. By that time he was older, in his mid-forties, and I think he had to find some way of protecting his family. At some point, he no longer belonged anywhere. He was certainly not a Nazi, but also no longer a communist. By then, he'd also lost the backing of his comrades. To reach such an extreme point in your life, to disavow everything you once believed in, because you can see your children are hungry and you can't go on anymore, because you have no strength left, he must have hated himself for it. Johann Esser's resistance seemed to have been broken, like the life of his wife. My grandmother became paranoid as a result of what happened. In the clinical records, schizophrenia was later diagnosed. Mm -hmm. She used to be full of energy, but she was no longer able to keep up, to look after the children, and the mental confusion overwhelmed her. First, she was sent to Grafenberg, and then, as we found out later, to two other clinics. And in the last clinic, she died. What was so tragic was that this was just a week before the clinic was liberated. Hmm. Johann Esser survived the Nazi terror and the forced labor. After the war, he remarried and took up his work as a trade unionist again. He also published poems. Spring 1940. Most Germans were not yet especially affected by the war, while half of Europe was in flames. German armies occupied Norway and Denmark, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. Hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war and civilians from Northern and Western Europe were taken to Germany to work in industry and agriculture. The self-proclaimed German master race looked down on them, but not in the same way as they did on the Poles. By occupying France and Belgium and the Netherlands, they had gained new reserves of forced labor. But you shouldn't forget that National Socialism had created a social system that was extremely racially organized. And their view of Western Europeans was entirely different to their view of the Slav population of Poland, who they regarded as subhumans. In the National Socialist forced labor system, there was a racial hierarchy. Civilian forced laborers from Western Europe weren't treated well, but they still fared better than Western European prisoners of war, and better still than those held in the prisons. Polish workers and prisoners of war were treated particularly harshly. The groups who had no rights at all were the Sinti and Roma, and political prisoners in the concentration camps. <laughs> 
right at the bottom of the hierarchy were the Jews. The lower down the hierarchy, the more inhumane the work they were forced to carry out. The more highly skilled the work was, the greater the chance of survival, because someone who had to do delicate welding work in a factory wouldn't be driven on with direct physical force with a whip. They would also have a certain level of interest in the product they were making. But on a construction site, a civilian guard or a German soldier guarding prisoners of war might stand behind them with a whip and beat them and force them to keep digging a pit until they collapsed from exhaustion. The National Socialist war economy needed increasing numbers of workers, and they were provided by the Wehrmacht, prisoners of war. Since, in accordance with the Geneva Convention, they could not be used in industry, hundreds of thousands of POWs were quickly given civilian status. Many German companies profited from this breach in international law. They were big companies, small family concerns, local authorities, churches, private households, the film industry, breweries. There was no area of the economy that didn't benefit from forced labor. It was a billion dollar business in wrongful treatment. The SS sold its prisoners and the Wehrmacht its prisoners of war to German companies. The men were held in central camps like this one in Zandbostel. This camp organized up to 670 labor units simultaneously. During the course of the war, over 300,000 prisoners of war and military and civilian internees were held here as forced laborers. The more Germans were sent to fight in the war, the greater the need for foreign workers, for road and bunker construction, in gardening businesses, slaughterhouses, hospitals, power stations, universities, armaments factories, and steel smelters, and even in the churches. Camps for prisoners of war and forced laborers were created all over the Reich. For the Germans, the site of these camps became part of everyday life. Civilian forced laborers and prisoners of war, concentration camp prisoners, Jews, Sinti and Roma, were all used for forced labor, visible everywhere. The town hall in Kreiburg on the Inn. Polish forced laborer Stefan Duda had just completed an eight-month prison sentence. His crime? To fall in love with a German farmer's daughter. On the morning of October the 10th, 1941, the SS took him here to the edge of the forest. People from the local community and other Polish forced laborers were also present. Stefan Duda was hanged. His was just one of hundreds of murders committed as punishment for racial defilement. For a long time, no one talked about what happened here in Taufkirchen, Bavaria, and the events were almost forgotten. Slavomir Pakita, Stefan Duda's great-nephew, only found out what happened to his great-uncle in 2019. When we look at this monument, I try not to think about the terrible images that I have seen, but rather about the efforts that have been made to reinstate the dignity of our great-uncle. He was a person who worked here, who lived here among the people who knew him, even though he was a Polish forced laborer. Our presence here is important for us, for the Poles and also for later generations. Thank you. We are very glad that we are here today and that we can now pray together with you. Polish and German mourning, nearly 80 years after the crime.
jako w niebie. Czucie smutku po otworzeniu i przeczytaniu tej tej historii. I was very sad. W zapoznaniu się z tym. There was a great sadness in me after I read the whole story. Chciałem, żeby on ode mnie. I didn't want it to be true. I didn't want it to be about a member of our family. Mojej rodziny, naszej rodziny. Love came at a very high price. Mieć miejsca. And here. The price was death. Wielką cenę, właśnie cenę śmierci. The building closest to the place of execution is Gasthof Meyer, a restaurant that then belonged to the grandparents of Hilarius Häusler's wife. Part of the history of this building is linked to Stefan Duda. Stefan Duda was executed in our forest. The Himmler decree was read out on our car park. And after the execution, our grandparents had to cook for this group of Nazis. When we took over the restaurant, we not only took over the building, but also responsibility for the history of this place. Stefan Duda died aged 26. Anna Meyerhofer, the German woman he loved, came back home from the concentration camp. After the war, she left the village and never returned. The level of brutality in Hitler's Reich continued to increase. Forced labor and mass murder were systematically interlinked, in the concentration camps too. Sachsenhausen near Berlin. After arresting their political opponents, the Nazis held Jews, homosexuals, so-called asocials, and Sinti and Roma here. They worked and died in the factories that produced bricks for Albert Speer's building projects. On the parade ground, a track was set up where prisoners were forced to test new sole materials for the shoe industry. Every prisoner in these shoe-walking units had to cover over 40 kilometers a day, carrying a heavy rucksack. Anyone who collapsed was shot. In the camps, in the countryside, in the towns and cities, and in the occupied territories, forced labor increasingly became the engine of the National Socialist State. The palace in Kresowice near Krakow. While the majority of the Polish population was made to work for the Germans, and thousands were taken away, harassed and murdered, Nicholas Frank, the son of the Governor General of Poland, spent his early childhood here. Certainly, we children felt something of the general atmosphere. We were living in a sea of blood. Nicholas Frank grew up with four brothers and sisters. His mother saw herself as a queen. His father was a mass murderer who ruled by violence. He ordered that the Polish Jews should particularly suffer. We drove through what I later found out was the Krakow ghetto. I looked out through the car window and saw so many sad people. That memory stayed with me. There was a boy standing close to the car. He was at least two or three years older than me, taller too, and I stuck my tongue out at him. He just turned around and walked away. And I saw it as a triumph, because a taller, stronger boy had let me stick my tongue out at him without doing anything back. I laughed in triumph, but that's what children are like. I should also say that I had no idea what was going on. We just had a feeling, subconsciously, that something was not right here. That's very clear. After the conquest of Poland, the Nazis established ghettos for Jews. At the end of 1941, the mass murder, the Holocaust, began. <laughs> 
Before the killing started, Jews had already been persecuted and stripped of their rights. In the ghettos, there was poverty, hunger, and infectious disease. The only hope was to survive through work. For the Jews who worked, it was a double-edged sword in the forced labor in the general government. Because uh, on the one hand, if you worked, that meant food. It's a matter of life and death. But by the same token, much of the forced labor was under such conditions that a Jewish person would want to evade the forced labor. And th these are terrible, among the many terrible dilemmas that Jews face from the very beginning. Anyone in the ghetto who wanted to survive needed work. That was the illusion, the salvation through work, and basically the desperate cry, let us live because we work so well for you. We sew such wonderful uniforms for the Wehrmacht. We produce such wonderful grenades for the Wehrmacht. Let us live so we can work for you. And then we stopped somewhere, and my mother got out of the car and said, children, no one makes better corsets than the Jews in the ghetto. That's really an incredible thing to say. And this is my father, presenting someone with a watch at the station in Krakow, because this young man was the million forced laborer he was sending to the Reich. This young man, as sad as he looked, had enormous courage. He was in the train when an SS man immediately stole the watch my father had given him. However, at some point, I don't know when, he jumped out of the train. And if they'd caught him, they'd have shot him at once. But he survived and was able to tell the story of how his watch was taken from him right after he'd been given it. Germany, spring 1941. Hitler was finally ready to wage the war he had always longed for, the war against the Soviet Union, against Bolshevism. More and more Germans were being called up, and more and more foreigners were taking on their work. Most of them were forced to do so. The National Socialist forced labor system had not yet reached its zenith. However, by September 1941, more than three and a half million forced laborers were being used to keep the war machine going. As well as the POW camps run by the Wehrmacht and the SS concentration camps, a growing number of so-called barracks camps were being set up by German companies to accommodate their own forced laborers. They were policed by the company's own security departments or by private security guards. To maintain discipline and prevent resistance, every aspect of the forced laborers' lives were regimented. The palace at Kresowice. It used to be owned by Count Potozzi before being seized by Hans Frank in 1939. Now, it's once again in the possession of the Polish aristocratic family. Krakow is 30 miles away. Here, the son of the butcher of Poland meets the grandson of the palace owner who lost his home. My grandfather remembers it at his, uh, his home that he was born into, and it's, it's, it's quite incredible that you have the same memory, regardless of what happened in history. Because uh, as an innocent child, this, you were told this is your home, family home. And so, our weekend castle. What do you personally think about my father? Honestly, he's a, he was a monster. I mean, I learned about your father not knowing about my family history at all not knowing the connections between the real estate and the properties, um, still living in the United States. And I learned about Hans Frank, the man who signed off on the duty, everything. He is responsible in the end. He did have, he could have stopped signing at one point. Oh. 
So the decision, could have a turning point really decision, retired. he could have. And because of that aspect that he could have did, did a turning point in history and he didn't do it, that makes him a worse man than he could have been. Yeah. You are right. When he left Krakow and Kresnov, he came to Upper Bavaria, sitting there in his office, waiting for someone to arrest him. He was like, maybe in a kind of shock. Everything lost, not anymore the king of Poland. So he didn't do anything. Didn't do you think anything. it was his form of reconcile for his sins? No. Because in the end, he asked my mother and his lawyer to find out the truth about him with the following sentence, I was never a criminal. And this for sure he was. Summer 1941. On June the 22nd, Germany attacked the Soviet Union. The scale of the atrocities reached new dimensions. So did that of forced labor. The attack on the Soviet Union marked a turning point, that's quite clear. And basically it meant that there were no more restraints, including ideological restraints. And this was the moment the mass exploitation began, particularly of Soviet workers, as forced laborers in the German Reich. Millions of people were forcibly taken from their homes, men, women and children. Millions of victims who made it possible for Germany to continue its war. Laborers for the madness of final victory of the Germanic race. <laughs> 